The reading this morning is from verses throughout Genesis chapter 1 to, through to Genesis chapter 3. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. The Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living being. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. Then the Lord God said, what is this you have done? And the Lord God banished them from the Garden of Eden. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks so much, Kat. Good morning again, everyone. I wonder if you have a place you like to go to where you feel most alive, where you feel most at peace, most at home in the world. For me, uh, that would be a place in Canada called Galliano Island, which is one of the Gulf Islands between Vancouver Island and the mainland. We have some friends there that own a small farm, and uh, we often stay there among their sheep and vegetable garden and their deer. Uh, and it's situated right on the water, surrounded by trees and mountains in one of what I think is one of the most beautiful and peaceful places on the planet. So Melissa and I would often stay there to rest and recuperate. The farm had a number of cabins. We would stay in one of those and look out over the water. And at certain times of the year, you could see orca migrating through the water. Sometimes seals or um, sea otters would come up onto the beach to sun themselves. One day we went for a hike along a ridge and ended up at eye level with bald eagles just floating on thermals, just over the cliff, barely an arm's length away. At night, you could kayak out onto the sea, and if you dipped your fingers in the water, or as you would stroke your oar through the water, it would light up with brilliant phosphorescence, like the sea was on fire. Now, perhaps it's just nostalgia, but time spent on Galliano felt to me like a brief glimpse of something truly human, a truly human existence as God intended it. As God intended life as described in Genesis chapter one as something deeply integrated with creation, at peace, a life without fear, close to the earth, like surrounded by beauty and by the freedom of wild things. But sadly, as we'd spend time there and it would be beautiful, but it wouldn't last. And that's the way it is whenever we encounter something beautiful, we can't hold on to it for long. Ordinary life comes crashing in and that inevitably leaves us feeling frustrated. It's almost like a kind of suffering, a kind of grief. 
Now, the German philosopher Martin Heidegger said in the early 20th century that to be human, to be human is to experience alienation. You know, that we're kind of, we're basically like thrown into this world and we have to make the best of it and no one really knows what they're doing or why we're here. And even though this is only the world, you know, this is the only world we've ever really known, we weirdly feel like it's not the world we belong in. Like it's not the world we were made for. And I love how C.S. Lewis describes this. He calls this sense of alienation our longing for a far off country. And in one of Lewis's most famous sermons called The Weight of Glory, he writes this. If this works. Ah. In speaking of this desire for our own far off country, which we find in ourselves even now, the secret which hurts so much that you take your revenge on it by calling it names like nostalgia or romanticism. The secret also which pierces with such sweetness, the secret we cannot hide and cannot tell, though we desire to do both. We cannot tell it because it is a desire for something that has never actually appeared in our experience. We cannot hide it because our experience is constantly suggesting it. Our commonest expedient is to call it beauty and behave as if that settled the matter. The books or the music in which we thought this beauty was located will betray us if we trust to them. It was not in them. It only came through them. And what came through them was longing. These things are good images of what we really desire, but if they are mistaken for the thing itself, they turn into dumb idols, breaking the hearts of their worshipers. For they are not the thing itself, they are only the scent of a flower we have not found, the echo of a tune we have not heard, news from a country we have never yet visited. I love that. They're only the scent of a flower we have not found, the echo of a tune we have not heard, news from a country we have never yet visited. I honestly think that that is one of the best descriptions of our fallen human condition that I know of. So to be human, what Lewis is saying is to be human is to be torn between the desire for something that we've been made for and the frustration, the unfulfilled longing that we experience because we cannot access it. As Genesis 3 tells us, we're banished from Eden because of our sin. Sorry, can we just go back? I think I've lost control of this. So I'll tell you when to, thank you. So as Genesis 3 tells us, we've been banished from Eden because of our sin, yet, yet the memory, the memory of Eden, this longing for our true home, this far off country remains deeply embedded in us, like it's in our bones, friends. As the scriptures say, we have eternity in our hearts. And because we were created then for, uh, for worship, to receive and reflect the glory of God, yet without God, we cannot do this. And so we seek uh, to experience this from dumb idols, from the dumb idols Lewis calls of temporary things. And I think we do this to try and build some kind of meaning for ourselves or to numb the pain of what we've lost. So every generation has its particular sins, its particular idols. And in our secular culture, the one that we're in right now, which has really pushed God out from the center to the margins, the primary idol that we now look for for meaning and identity is ourselves. As David Brooks of the New York Times says, people today believe that when you're figuring out how to lead your life, the most important answers are found deep inside yourself. So next slide, just be yourself. Or as Brian Rosner of Ridley College says, identity is now a do-it-yourself project. A gym near where I live advertises itself with the slogan, be fit, be well, be you. High schools are also in on the act. One school marketing campaign gave this advice to its current and prospective students. Be inspired, be challenged, be excellent, be you. So the goal for every pupil is to leave school singing the song from The Greatest Showman. Look out! because here I come. 
I mean, this is the anthem of our age, unapologetically marching to your own drumbeat and proudly announcing to the world who you really are. But I think it's becoming clearer and clearer that this just isn't working, which is no surprise, really, because you simply cannot build a stable sense of self, a stable identity, if you don't have the right resources to do it. And people are being told to just look inward, next slide, to create yourself out of yourself on the basis of yourself, as we explored in our Jesus and Culture series. But all this has done is to lead us to a massive explosion of mental health problems, really unlike anything that we have seen before, especially among young people. And the reason is that we are simply not designed to bear the crushing psychological and emotional weight of trying to build our own identities. And another problem here is that our culture is constantly sending us mixed messages. You know, on the one hand, we're told that we live in a godless universe that has no meaning and no purpose. And on the other hand, we're told that our lives have dignity and are worthy of respect and that everyone is valuable. But on what basis do we make those claims? Here's what uh, Yuval Harari says in his book, Sapiens, next slide. As far as we can tell, human life has absolutely no meaning. Humans are the outcome of blind, evolutionary processes that operate without goal or purpose. Our actions are not part of some divine cosmic plan, and if planet Earth were to blow up tomorrow morning, the universe would probably keep on going about its business as usual. As far as we can tell at this point, human subjectivity would not be missed. Hence, any meaning that people inscribe to their lives is just a delusion. You're right? So then we say, to our, you know, we, we say this, and then we say to our children, but hey, if you look inside yourself, like really, really deep inside yourself, you'll discover something that is just truly and uniquely you. And everyone needs to experience, you need to express it into the world. But who are you really, friends? Who are you really if we're just a cosmic accident floating on a tiny blue ball in the vast cold vacuum of space? Now, if God does not exist and everything is meaningless, why do we still have this desperate longing for transcendence that we just cannot seem to escape? It's, I find it hard to see what like, evolutionary purpose this might serve. And I think the truth is then that we are haunted by our memory of God and our life in Eden. We're haunted by it. Right? So we compensate by doing what Lewis said. We make idols out of stuff. We worship stuff, whatever it is, travel, money, sex, amazing experiences, career, family, success, but you cannot build an identity on those things. They will break your heart. And I'm gonna come back to that at the end. But it's pretty clear, I think, to anyone who's paying attention that this is not making us happier or freer or more at peace within ourselves or, or this is definitely not making for a more peaceful society. I mean, just look at what is going on in the West right now. In a recent talk, David Brooks, who I quoted earlier, says that research is showing that in the last two decades, we have gotten a lot sadder as Western societies. You know, we're seeing rising suicide rates, huge mental health problems, especially among teenagers, and there's an epidemic of loneliness. The number of people who say that they have no close friends has gone up fourfold since the year 2000. People finding long-term romantic partners has gone down by a third, so we have less marriages, the birth rate is plummeting globally, so we have fewer children, and with the loss of families comes the loss of community, and therefore the loss of social cohesion, and so it's no surprise that the people who rate themselves in the lowest category of happiness in the West has gone up by 50% since the year 2000. 50%. And so our sad and lonely culture has become more fragmented, more angry, more pessimistic, and more negative. And we can see how that's playing out in our politics. I mean, David Brooks calls this a global spiritual recession, which is leading a lot of people to turn politics into a form of quasi-religious social therapy. And if you've been watching the news lately, you've seen a lot of that. But hey, it's okay, friends, just look inside yourself and believe, just be yourself and everything will be fine. Next slide. <laughs> I 
Now, as we reflect on all of this, the reading this morning from Genesis 1 through 3 clearly shows, clearly shows us, I think, that this is not the way it's meant to be. That this is not the way the world was created to function. It was not always like this. This is not the world that we were made for. Like Heidegger is right, this is not the world that we were made for. And we are not the people that we are supposed to be. So what have we lost? And is there a way back? And today, as we think about these big questions, we are starting a new series called Being Human. And over the next eight weeks, what we wanna do is explore from a biblical and theological point of view what it means to be human. What are humans for? Why did God make us? What are the sources of our identity? And the focus will be to really try and understand and go deeper into something that Genesis 1 calls the Imago Dei, that human beings have been made in the image of God, that we are image bearers of God, made in the image and likeness of God. And we're gonna look at this image bearing through a number of different aspects. Um, how we bear God's image in our bodies, how we bear God's image in our minds, excuse me for just a moment. How we bear God's image in our emotions, how we bear God's image in our relationships, in our families and communities, how we bear God's image in our sexuality, and finally, how we bear God's image in our work and our rest. And we're gonna explore this, especially through the lens of Genesis 1 through 3, and of course, in the person of Jesus, who we believe is not only God incarnate, God in human flesh, but is also the perfect human being. In fact, the only perfect human being who has ever lived. And so therefore, he is the complete and perfect Imago Dei, the complete and perfect image bearer of God's likeness. As Paul puts it in Colossians 1, Jesus, is the, Jesus the Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, through his blood shed on the cross. An amazing passage of scripture. And if Jesus, then, friends, is the perfect human and the savior of all things, and the one who holds all things together, then we'll be looking at how Jesus' humanity shows us God's intention for our own humanity, how we're called to be human after the pattern and likeness of Jesus, and how Jesus coming among us redeems and restores us as image bearers of God. So that's what we're gonna be exploring. And it really boils down to this question of what it means to be human created in the image and likeness of God. So what I'm most interested in this morning uh, is verse 27, it's on the screen, where this is repeated three times. And if you know anything about how scripture works, when something's repeated three times, it means it's really, really important. God is a trinity, and whenever something's repeated three times, it's saying this is something that you need to pay attention to. God is communicating something fundamental to us here. And we're told three times that God created mankind in his own image, in the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Okay, so this might seem really obvious, so forgive me, but Genesis is telling us, therefore, that we are not self-determining, that we are creatures, created beings. And that means the only reason we exist and the only reason we continue to exist is because God holds all this together, because he wills it to happen, moment by moment. We are completely and utterly dependent on God, whether we realize it or not, whether we want this to be true or not, we are completely and utterly dependent on God for our very existence. We are created beings, we did not create ourselves and we are not self-determining. That at the very core of everything is what it truly means to be human. 
And so therefore that goes right to the heart of what our rebellion means because we believe the lie of the serpent that somehow God was holding out on us, right? Somehow God was keeping something back from us. But that if we took control, if we took control, if we ate from the tree of self-determination, then we'd get a better deal. It was a lie then and it's a lie now. And it has brought us nothing but death. Let's keep digging. In Genesis 1, all the plants and animals are described as being made according to their kinds. Plants, birds, fish, land animals, all according to their kinds. It's repeated a number of times, according to their kinds. But it's only when God comes to making Adam, and by the way, the word Adam just means the human, Adam, the human, and it's related to the Hebrew word Adamah, which just means the dirt. So the human from the dirt, that's what that means. So when it comes to making Adam, it's only this particular being, this human, who is not made according to his kind, but instead he alone is made in the likeness of God. Only Adam is created according to God's kind. So what is it about humans specifically then, as opposed to all the other animals, that uniquely bears the image and likeness of God. Well, do you wanna know something that's really frustrating? Really frustrating? Genesis actually doesn't tell us. Next slide. It's not at all clear in the story what this means. And the more that I've thought about it, I've come to see that this is actually a feature, not a bug. This is a feature of the story, not a bug. Now bear with me. This is on purpose. We're not, it's not explained to us particularly clearly what it means to be made in the image of God, and this is on purpose. Now, don't get me wrong. There are hundreds of thousands of books that have been written on this throughout the centuries, exploring the meaning of the Imago Dei. What does it mean to be made in the image of God? And there are as many theories about this as there are books. Now, some argue, it's this on the screen, that it's got to do with our intelligence. You know, we're... we're uh, the, our image bearing is about how our minds work, our cognitive abilities. Others say it's about our creativity, like we can make things, we create art and beauty and music and sculpture and poetry. In fact, the first piece of art ever created according to Genesis is a love poem that Adam sings to his wife. Um, is it our emotions, like our complex inner lives, our consciousness? Is it our ability to love and form families and build societies and communities? Is it our moral agency? Is it the fact that we're moral people, that we have kind of a, a moral sense and therefore an agency, a, a, a responsibility given to us by God to live moral lives in the universe because our lives really matter? Is that what it's about? Now, it's absolutely true that all of those things are part of what makes us human. They are God's gifts to us. But I do not think that it's any of those things that make us the imago Dei, that, that demonstrate the image and likeness of God. And in a sense, I agree with Charles Darwin when he wrote in The Descent of Man that the difference between humans and animals, great as it is, is one of degree and not of kind. Because he went on to say that we do see all of those capacities in various ways to greater or lesser degree in the animals. But I want to go further. I think it's absolutely essential that we do not put the meaning of our image bearing on any of those capacities. In fact, I think that would be a disaster. And here's why. Because whatever it means to be made in the image of God, the key thing is that it's given equally to all people as a gift of God. Can we all, we all say that together? A gift of God. Let's try that one more time. A gift of God. It's not a human capacity, it's a gift of God. And that means it's not some capacity that we perform or ability that we present to God in the hope of a reward or to achieve some kind of status. And here's why, if the image, this is so important, if the image of God is something earned or performed, then number one, that means it can also be lost or never achieved in the first place. Number two, it may be earned by some people and not by others. And number three, 
Some people may possess it to a greater degree than others. And the consequences of that would be a disaster. Because if our image bearing has to do with some human capacity or human quality like rationality or intelligence or language or creativity or beauty, even those things, even though those things are all gifts of God, and I think Christopher Watkin describes this beautifully. He says in his book, Biblical Critical Theory, next slide, that what if certain individuals do not possess the requisite capacities to get them across the line of humanity? What about the rationality of those with severe mental disabilities? What about the very young or the unborn? What about the very old? Any account of our Imago Day that pins human distinctiveness on a particular capacity is hostage to the argument that some human beings simply do not possess the capacity in question or do not possess enough of it and therefore have no value and no right to the dignity or protection afforded by being human. Do you start to see why this is so important? And we have seen this exact argument, whether because of race or gender or age or mental or physical ability or poverty or disease or social status, used time and time again through history to claim that certain kinds of people are not in fact human or a subhuman or a fit only to be slaves or a drain on society and need to go away, or, or do not deserve to have the same rights as others, or even the right to exist. The fact that Genesis 1 does not explicitly name what it is about humans that makes us in, in the image of God, other than to make it totally clear that it is a gift of God given to every human being, means that our worth and our value, our significance, our dignity as human beings is not on the basis of performance or ability or intelligence or personality or, or any other quality, other than that God has named us this way. Therefore, there is no cause for boasting. No human can boast, no human can claim higher status over any other, for we are all equal in the eyes of God. There is no better than or less than, regardless of our capacities or achievements or lack thereof. And as Genesis makes clear, this is true for both men and women, though we're different, we are of equal value and equal status before God. That means that all people, are both equally humble before God and dependent on God, and we are also of such great value and great worth, more than we could ever possibly imagine. So we are both totally humble and dependent on God, and we are, both of, we are all of incredible status and dignity and value before God. As Tim Keller says, next slide, Christianity, because of the doctrine of the image of God, can say to people, grounded in ultimate reality, that God does not make junk. You are made in the image of God. It doesn't matter who you are or what you have done. It doesn't matter how low you have gone. You are of infinite value to God. And that, that is what it means to be human. And not only is this the basis for all human dignity, all human equality, and all human rights. Like if you don't have this, you do not have human rights. This is also the, the, the ultimate source of our identity, of our self. Like even though we're fallen sinners, this status as God's image bearers remains true. I mean, we don't reflect God's image and likeness as we were intended to, like because of our sin, it's almost like we're all broken mirrors and the reflection uh, that, you know, that, that radiates out of us from the glory of God is now distorted. But the Imago Dei remains true nonetheless because it does not depend on our performance. It's the gift of God. So, as we land this plane, let me ask you then, what is human identity? 
I think identity is having confidence of your value as a person, having confidence in your, in your worth. But where does this come from? As we've already explored, it is an illusion to say that my identity comes from within me, from my inner feelings, from inside myself. The reality is we are all looking for validation and value from the world around us, from the people around us. Like you cannot be human without this. Why? Because Genesis makes clear that we're all relational beings. We're all made to exist in relationship with God and with others. And so we can only properly exist as human beings in relationship with God and in right relationship with others. And that is how we build our sense of self. So as you know, when our relationships are healthy, you know when we've grown up in a healthy family and we've received love and validation, we have confidence that we have worth and value to those we love and, that, and from those who love us. But when you've grown up in an unhealthy family or you're in unhealthy relationships, it can destroy you. It can erode your sense of self. It can erode your sense of worth. It can devalue you. It causes us great pain, right? But even the best human relationships, even the best human relationships, the best career or the most money or the most incredible beauty or the most amazing creativity and despite all the recognition that you might get from other people on the basis of those things, none of those things will be enough in the long run to build a stable identity because they'll all fail you in the end, right? People will let you down. Even the ones who love you the most will let you down. They will fail you. Someone better or more beautiful or more talented than you will inevitably come along and if you've built your identity on any of those things, then where will that leave you when that's gone? Who will you be when you're no longer, as, no longer the best, when you're no longer the most beautiful, when you're no longer the most talented? If you run out of money, if you lose your job, if someone you love dies, where will you be? Who will you be? And when those things are gone, you'll feel terrible. You'll feel empty, you'll feel worthless. If you take any of those good things which are God's gifts to us and try to build your identity on them, as Lewis says, they will break your heart in the end. They will break you in the end. So what kind of identity do we need? And I think, this is what Genesis is telling us, that next slide, you cannot build yourself, you cannot make yourself, you cannot bless yourself, and you cannot name yourself. So yes, you need recognition. Yes, you need somebody from outside of yourself to come and name you, to name who you are. Tim Keller says, in order to be human, you need the love, you need the acceptance, you need the approval, and you need the esteem of someone who is greater than you. You need the esteem of someone you esteem if you're going to have any self-esteem. And this person, whoever it is, cannot be someone who will ever let you down or fail you or change their mind about you based on your performance. You need someone who will love you and adore you and accept you regardless of your performance, regardless of your abilities, regardless of your success or failure, and the only person who can do that is Jesus. And when you know the love of God in Jesus Christ, when you truly know it, when it's the most important thing about you, then that is the most powerful basis for a stable identity and a stable sense of self that exists in the universe. There is nowhere else that you can build a stable identity other than on the name of Jesus, on the person of Jesus. That's why Paul says in Romans 8, next slide, the spirit that you have received, pardon me, I've got a bit of a cold this morning. The spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received when you believed brought about your adoption to sonship, brought into the family, and by him we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children, and if we are God's children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If we share in his sufferings, we will also share in his glory. And what Paul is saying is that when you receive Christ, 
when you receive Christ, God is testifying right into the center of your being that you belong to God, that you are a child of God, that you don't need to be afraid, that God is your father, that you are an heir of Christ, you've received the glory of Christ and that you have a future and a hope and nothing can take that away from you. That's what happens when we believe. God rebuilds our identity in Christ Jesus. And if that is not a basis for a stable sense of self, then I don't know what is. And God really means this, friends. He doesn't just name us from a distance or love us from a distance or welcome us from a distance. No, he came close to us in Christ, for Christ took on flesh, became one of us, lived as one of us, showed us the love of the Father, died for us, laid down his life for us. This is how much God was prepared to show us that we are loved. And that means, friends, whether you're the least or the greatest, whether you're the most beautiful or the ugliest person on the planet, whether you're the most accomplished or the biggest failure, you are loved equally by your Father in heaven. You are of infinite value to him and nothing can take that away from you if you are in Christ. Because Christ died for you so that you can receive all that he is. And so, friends, I'm going to invite the band to come on up. They're going to lead us in our final song this morning. If you believe in Jesus, or if this morning you want to believe in Jesus, all you have to do is say, thank you, Lord Jesus, for your grace. I want to follow you. I want to receive my true identity from you. Forgive me of my rebellion and remake me as a child of God. And he will, friends, he will make you a new creation. You will hear God speak your true name into the depths of your soul. He will make you a child of God and he will make you an heir of Christ. He will say to you, you are mine and I'm with you always right to the very end and forever and ever, amen. And that means if you pray that prayer, if you, if you want that this morning, it takes the pressure off us having to be more than we are. We no longer need to prove anything. We no longer need to live in fear. We no longer need to compare ourselves with other people. In other words, friends, the way home to Eden has been open to us and we can come in and we can rest. So as Paul says in Colossians 2, in Christ, you have received the fullness of God. In Christ, you have received the fullness of God. And that is what it means to be human.